If it is clear that a financial contribution exists under Article 1.1a of the SCM Agreement, what is the next step in determining whether a subsidy exists? The definition of a subsidy under Article 1.1 of the SCM Agreement includes two elements. First, a financial contribution by a government or public body, and second, the conferral of a benefit. But what is a benefit in the context of the SCM Agreement? The SCM Agreement does not actually provide a definition of the term benefit, and until the dispute Canada Aircraft was brought to the WTO, there were two competing schools of thought on the meaning of the term. On the one hand, there was the view that benefit should be measured by reference to the cost to government of making the financial contribution. On the other hand was the idea that the term refers to the benefit to the recipient of the financial contribution. In Canada Aircraft, both the panel and the appellate body agreed that the latter interpretation of benefit should prevail. In the view of both, this definition of benefit is the most suitable to capture the trade distorting potential of a financial contribution. The appellate body noted that whether a financial contribution confers a benefit depends upon whether the financial contribution places the recipient in a more advantageous position than would otherwise have been the case in the absence of the financial contribution. Using Article 14 of the SCM Agreement as relevant context, both the panel and the appellate body agreed that the marketplace is the appropriate comparator for determining what the position of the recipient would have been in the absence of the financial contribution. In sum, Canada Aircraft established that a subsidy exists when a financial contribution is provided on terms that are more advantageous than would have been available to the recipient on the market. Let's consider the case of a government providing a loan to a company. How do we know whether a benefit, and therefore a subsidy, exists as a result of this loan? According to Article 14b of the SCM Agreement, which provides guidelines for calculating the amount of the benefit in these circumstances, unless the government provides the loan on terms more favourable than the company could have obtained on the market, there will be no benefit and consequently no subsidy. For example, if the government offers a loan to a particular borrower for 8% per annum, but the going interest rate is 10% per annum for commercial loans of the same size and to borrowers with the same credit risk as the recipient of the government loan, a benefit will exist because the borrower is receiving the loan from the government on terms more advantageous than those that would have been available to it on the market. What about when a government purchases goods from a company? When does this give rise to a subsidy? Article 14D of the SCM Agreement clarifies that this will not confer a benefit unless the purchase is made for more than adequate remuneration. The adequacy of the remuneration is determined by reference to prevailing market conditions for the good in question in the country of purchase. Therefore, if a government were to purchase 100 tonnes of steel from a manufacturer, for example, a benefit would be conferred if the government paid more for this shipment than the manufacturer would be able to receive if it sold the same quantity and quality of steel on the marketplace. Therefore, the Canada Aircraft dispute clarified that it is possible for a subsidy to exist even where in fact the financial contribution involves no cost to government or charge on the public account. For example, if a government provides a financial contribution in the form of a loan guarantee, it may be that the recipient of the guarantee never defaults on the loan and so the government is never called upon to transfer any funds. Nevertheless, if the recipient of the government guarantee is able to obtain a loan it would not otherwise have received or to obtain a loan on terms more favourable than would have been the case absent the guarantee, that recipient will have received a benefit and therefore a subsidy. In sum, if it is evident that a financial contribution exists, the second step for determining whether the financial contribution gives rise to a subsidy is to examine whether a benefit is conferred. This is determined by examining whether the financial contribution is provided to the recipient on terms more favourable than those that would have been available to it on the market. Thank you.